everyone, and welcome to AWS for Games Boss Level, the podcast where we bring in AWS experts to discuss solutions and services that are essential for modern game development and how you can get started on your cloud game development journey on AWS. My name is Chris Melisinos, and I'm the Principal Evangelist for Video Games at AWS. And on this episode of Boss Level, our first episode, we're discussing the importance of game analytics, how they can be used to help improve player retention, remove player friction, refine your game for a broader audience, and gain important insights into who and how your games are being played and enjoyed. So let's jump in and meet our panel of AWS for Games specialists and discuss game analytics. And here we are with our panel of experts from AWS for Games. Please introduce yourselves. Tim Bruce, I'm a senior solutions architect in AWS Game Tech. Dominic Mills, I'm also a game solutions architect. Gabriel Batista, I'm a solutions architect here at AWS. McCarthy Gordopoli, principal solution architect supporting Riot Games as a customer. Awesome, awesome. And on today's program, we're going to kick off this podcast series by talking about a really important topic that helps game developers better understand how people are playing their games, on what devices they're playing, and how to improve gameplay overall. And that is around analytics in games. But before we jump into that, we got to find out what are y'all playing? So Tim, tell us, what are you playing right now? I'm going old school with Civ Six. Uh, they just did a release of Julius Caesar. And uh, while I was playing the monthly challenge, I saw a bunch of people on Reddit talking about how OP he is. And uh, man, I got to tell you, like this is the easiest deity level game I've ever played. <laughs> <laughs> I can't play those games. It's too much detail on screen. You know, I'm the single red button guy right or two sticks for robotron 2084 but good on you man good on you <laughs> dominic how about you what are you playing right now buddy uh right now i'm getting back into the finals they had a, a pre-release play period a while back which was a ton of fun i just jumped in with my friends it was my first time like getting back into an arena shooter in a long time um, it's made by the same a lot of the same developers who made battlefield um, so it's got that same feel, you know, like destructible terrain, a bunch of different weapons, uh, different abilities to kind of have different classes in there, but it's just like great to get back into a game, like with your friends and just really like get back into a good shooter, you know? So that's really exciting. And they just sort of surprise launched at the game awards. So mm -hmm. that was, that was an awesome, awesome gift. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. Gabriel, how about you, buddy? Oh man, I'm going old school. So I've settled quite a few arguments in Tetris in my day. Uh, so I've kind of gone back to my roots. I've been playing Tetris Effect Connected on the PlayStation 5. Um, the goal being nailing my record for sprints, which is how fast can you clear 40 lines? I'm down to two minutes and four seconds. I have a good friend of mine that can do it in about a minute and 10. So I got a ways to go, but I'm, I'm working my way there. Wow. No, that is awesome. Yeah, I had the pleasure of actually meeting Alexei Pajadnov at the Game Beat Summit uh, just a couple of months ago. And uh, there aren't very many people that I still get tongue-tied around, but he was definitely one of them. So, And of course, Tetris <laughs> yeah. DX is the best version of Tetris ever released on the Game Boy Color. But, but yes, but Tetris Effect is beautiful and stunning, and they did an incredible job with it. So really, really cool. Awesome. All right, and Karthik, what are you playing? Well, I'm I'm switching to, I'm switching between two games. So with my little one, my six year old daughter, I'm playing uh, Link's Awakening: Legend of Zelda on the Nintendo Switch. Yeah. And then when she's off to school, then I'm playing Mario Wonder because I want to hog all the time with Mario Wonder, and then later introduce her to Mario Wonder. So I'm alternating between those two games on the Nintendo Switch platform. Very, very cool. Yeah, Mario Wonder is one of the two games that I'm cranking through right now, and it is one of the most joyous games I think I've ever played. It just, you can't, if you're not smiling playing this, I don't know where your soul is, right? So, yes, yeah, Super Mario Brothers Wonder is amazing. And then I'm also cranking through Hogwarts, which is just absolutely staggering, absolutely beautiful. So uh, hopefully with the break, we have a little bit of time to dig further into those. So. Great game selections all the way around, gentlemen. Great game selections. So, 
All right, so today we are gathered together to talk about analytics in games. Um, with the ever-increasing adoption of games as a service model, um, it's really more critical than ever for modern studios to really develop a deeper understanding of how players interact with their games. Why don't we talk about, you know, why... So why do analytics matter within games? So Gabe, maybe you want to go ahead and kind of get us kicked off. Yeah, that's that's a great question, right? So by analyzing gameplay metrics and log data, studios can gain valuable insight into how players interact with their game. Uh, like you said, with the live ops model that we see in games nowadays, uh, it becomes really important for you to not only understand how your players are using the game, but uh, where issues lie or there or where there might be gaps uh, in your gameplay. Um, by gathering all of this data and having it in a single place, uh, let's call it a single pane of glass, you can get an overview of the health of your game, whether your players are having fun and where your studio should be focusing their time and resources. Yeah, I think having it in that single pane of glass so you can see kind of all those different variables and understand some data with regard to where people are getting hung up and what other uh, factors may be contributing to players getting stuck in games or players abandoning games, right? Which is what we don't want them to do, right? One of the big places analytics is going to help is uncovering those problem areas so we could smooth out the gameplay for those players over time. But if you're standing up an analytics pipeline, right? If this is new to you, you know, what does a typical analytics pipeline really look like? Yeah, so typically an analytics workload is broken up into four phases. We have collect, process, store, and analyze. Now, the implement implementation detail uh, of this pipeline is usually driven by a studio's particular needs, like uh, how fresh they want that data to be, the types of query patterns that they're going to be using against the data, how long they plan to store it, and most importantly, how much money they're willing to spend on it. Um, we actually have a great example of a baseline analytics pipeline in the game analytics pipeline solution uh, offered by AWS. This is a solution built by solutions architects for our customers. It's totally open source and it gives a really strong basis for a studio to come in, deploy and run an analytics pipeline with mock data, and then customize it to their particular needs and give them a great head start in their own analytical workloads. So this is... Um, really a way for a game developer who may not be familiar with stand up and analytics pipeline to play around with data we've already populated with and start to understand how all of those pieces fit together? That's exactly it. And uh, we've recently released our version two of the solution. Um, as in its original version, it was built out with CloudFormation, which is our infrastructure as code uh, framework. Uh, we've since moved to the cloud development kit, uh, which is a, instead of using the traditional YAML or JSON language, uh, we moved to programming languages. Um, in this case, TypeScript to make it easier for our customers to interact with the pipeline and upgrade it. Very cool. All right, so let, but let me ask you a question though. So how can developers ensure they're investing their resources appropriately to retain their players? So, the most important thing is to understand what your players are doing, right? Ensuring that your players are happy and enjoying your game. Like you mentioned earlier, if players are getting stuck in a particular level, that becomes an item of interest. Um, by seeing all of this information in a single place, it really gives studios the power to focus their limited resources on what matters most and what's going to ultimately drive the enjoyment um, of their game from the players. That's ultimately the most important thing. If your players are happy, if your players are having fun, they will stay, they will continue to support you. So, um, Tim, uh, maybe you want to weigh in here. So when we talk about sharing uh, that data with publishers and developers, maybe you can lean in a bit there, right? Because when we talk about that data, that data is super sensitive and maybe very specific to you know, a particular type of game or a particular series of games for a particular publisher. And that's kind of the lifeblood right of operating live ops games is that data so maybe can you tell us a bit about how that data gets shared and the kind of assurances that a company like aws can place around the capability of sharing those and protecting that that data sure so some of the challenges that developers and publishers have is right they're they're all in it for the same thing players playing the game right they all want happy players 
as Gabe just mentioned. The challenge is, is that the developers are going to do the work on the game to build out new features or update existing features in the game. And publishers just want to make sure that the game is running well and that their players see it as something valuable. Um, so the first thing that developers and publishers think about is we both need some of that data and none of them want to send it from the client two times, right? Once to the developer and then once to the publisher. Uh, if you think about it, it's a waste of network resources and on mobile, it's a waste of battery as well. So they, they want to look at AWS and say, how do we help publishers and developers both monitor the same game? And there's a couple of different ways based on the requirements of the publisher and the developer. So in some cases, publishers and developers want to run real-time analytics on that data. Well, as Gabe mentioned, we have a collect um, portion of the game analytics pipeline. And that's really focused on something like Amazon API Gateway to collect the data at a front door. And right behind Amazon API Gateway, you can use a messaging service like Simple Notification Service or a routing service like Amazon Event Bridge to route the data to two different accounts so that both can do their live analytics. Um, if they don't have a need for live analytics, if both don't have a need for live analytics, you can use something at the stored portion of the game analytics pipeline. Right, and in this case, we're using Amazon S3 buckets to store the data. And with a couple of lines of configuration, you can simply set up replication for that bucket to be able to share that data across different accounts. So both the publisher and the developer can see the same data. Finally, if you just have a need to see the data or see the results of the data, uh, you can use your favorite BI tool or something like Amazon QuickSight to do reports on the data from one of the accounts and share those with the, the other side of the equation, whether it's the developer or the publisher. All right, so, so we are enabling developers to get one single source of data basically into the system, right? Into a solution yep. in the back end, and then we can actually go ahead and replicate and, and route that content to a variety of different services that help build out their full analytics pipeline, correct? Correct as well as route that to other accounts so that both both sides of the equation can see the same data at the same time. Very cool. Okay, but as you know, as I mentioned, right at the top of you know our conversation here, um, that data is super important, right? And and it is really held closely by by the publishers. Um, so when they're considering sharing that data, like what are some of the challenges with data sharing? for publishers and developers that that they kind of um, face today or assume is going to be a challenge for them? Yeah, so, so one of the things that I've heard from developers and publishers is that they have this top level requirement of we must see the same thing at the same time, both in real time. And, and that's a false challenge that some, some developers and publishers think about. Uh, one of the other challenges is that a developer may have very specific data that they need to see that the publisher doesn't or vice versa. Um, these messaging solutions that I mentioned, Simple Notification Service and EventBridge can allow developers and publishers to pick which messages they wanna share. So if there is something that is very appropriate for only the developer or only the publisher, uh, they can choose to not replicate that to the other side. Um, so it's all in their control of what gets replicated and how. Right. So we can give them really granular control over what gets shared to whom. And that can actually be shared across a variety of partners that may be operating different pieces of their business or, or of their game and their application, um, or even serving things out to, let's say, an ad network or sh sh sending things out to, you know, a centralized, uh, you know, leaderboard system that may be tied to other uh, product or game uh, leaderboards, right? So again, yeah. we're able to give you really granular control over the type of data, the frequency of that data, where it goes, who gets to see it, all at the fingertips, right, of the developer, right? Being able to control that. Absolutely. Very cool. All right, so some of this sounds, and it sounds like a lot of services is that uh, you have to get together to uh, make these sorts of things happen. So how does one kind of 
look at costs building these types of services that line up with the solutions that we're talking about here. So how do those costs line up with the solutions we're recommending? So the, the costs really line up um, in terms of uh, most expensive to least expensive with the real-time solutions being the most expensive, um, right? The more you're sharing data up front, the more double processing you might have to do. Um, and that leads to extra costs for both the developer and the publisher. But if it's needed, it's needed. Um, as you move further back, right, the S3 bucket replication or just sharing reports, those become less expensive solutions. So you really have it in your decision-making power to pick the solution that one, matters for you, and two, lines up with your budget. Yeah, so I would assume then, you know, something that doesn't require live services, um, it can be a less expensive solution just to kind of look at that data in, in a batch format, then make those changes over time, right? Kind of asynchronously from gameplay. Then right. again, you can kind of build up into a live ops, you know, or a live service that could utilize those same backends. And of course your cost would scale based on how much data you're using, how much connection you have back to those other services. So you have a whole range of solutions and cost and needs from the jump that's all built on the same exact tools, right? The same exact services on the back end, correct? Correct, you got it. Yeah, right. So basically having to fit any budget, any game of any size and grow with your needs as they emerge, right? And, and the best part is, is the more players you have, yeah, obviously you're gonna pay more, but that's a great problem to have. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Having more players, spending more time in your game, right? D having more interaction, spending more is not a bad problem to have. And of course, again, the solutions that we provide will help scale to meet the demand of the, those player bases, right? And a global infrastructure and make sure you have the right solution to get the right analytics data out of there and make sure that you have a better game, uh, you know, a better game experience for your players, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. But... You know, sometimes if you're not used to building these types of services, it can be difficult to figure out when you should really start thinking about these types of uh, analytics tools, right? These types of live ops tools. So Dominic, you know, at what stage of development should studios really think about or implement analytics um, from development to deployment? That's a really good question, Chris. I, has anyone ever told you that you ask good questions? <laughs> <laughs> I try, my friend, I try. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a good question. I say that because it's actually changed a lot over the years. I mean, even as recently as five years ago, I think a lot of developers were, this is what we saw, a lot of developers were adding in their analytics pipelines kind of almost felt like an afterthought, right? They're like, hey, let's get our core gameplay um, figured out. Let's find the fun, um, start building out features, different game modes, whatever it may be. Uh, and then, you know, at some point, even sometimes post launch, uh, then they would add in their analytics pipeline and be like, okay, now we're going to start, you know, figuring out monetization now that we have the players and really try and, and start optimizing based off of that. Right. Um, but what I've started to see in recent years and, and been helping customers with is actually implementing these analytics pipelines earlier and earlier into the game development process and life cycle. Um, and I think it's actually for a, a really awesome reason, which is they want to get feedback from the players, right? They want their development to be driven by player feedback and, and what players want, um, which, you know, as a player myself, I think is fantastic. And honestly, it's like a win-win for both sides, right? The developers know that the the time that they're investing, like Gabe said, like every studio feels like they have limited resources and they do, right? Um, so they're trying to find the areas where they can get like the most um, value, the most player enjoyment out of their development time. So they wanna focus on the things that players care about. And obviously that's great for players as well because they get to see the game that, that they wanna play. So, it's really a win-win um, and it means that having this analytics pipeline established early in your game development process uh, really helps you to understand and drive which direction 
uh, you're going to invest your studio's time. So <clears throat> think about how many games recently have had like multiple pre launch play periods, right? Like whether they're alphas, betas, um, you call them multiplayer tests, whatever it may be. Uh, I think part of the reason that developers are doing this is, is that they're great opportunities, not only to like stress test your game in terms of like server capacity and other technical factors, but it's also a really, really good opportunity to see how your players are playing your game, how they're engaging with your game, right? right. Um, if, if say you're, uh, like someone like the finals, uh, I'll, I'll do a callback to what I'm playing right now. Um, <clears throat> you know, those developers, they could see which game modes are really popular uh, and maybe even break down like the demographics of who are playing in those various game modes and, and get a better understanding of their player base. Um, and again, where their time might be best spent, you know, improving this game mode or, or working on this feature because it really has like high engagement values, right? Um, so I, I, I've really seen the shift in the industry over the past couple of years and yeah, it, it just, all of this means that game analytics pipelines, right, uh, are just even more important than they used to be. And, and being able to, uh, implement one that's cost effective, uh, and not too much overhead is really, really key to that. Yeah. No, and I think we you know one of the things that we encourage game developers to continue to do is start integrating the notion of their cloud services much earlier on in the development cycle than they used to, right? To your point, you know, it was all about, well, let me go in and get this vertical slice of the game done. I have to get the core game loop finished. I have to get core game mechanics done, core map, because typically those developers are going for funding. They're looking for publishers, and so they want to feed those in there. But understanding that most games say if you do not have those live ops services if you are not deploying online to a global audience you're limiting your reach you're limiting the amount of people that are going to be able to go and play your game but it requires an uh, understanding of how those tools fit together the earlier you can kind of inject them into the development pipeline the better off you're going to be because you're going to be able to utilize those tools as you pointed out during the development process so i can see analytics even being used during development by level designers where are they running into issues or what are some of the things that they are consistently doing right um that lineup that create a good gameplay or good level design or some places where we see this real divergence between multiple levels if you have different designers working on different things right so you can even use those analytics tools during the development with your own internal development team not just after the fact right not just after you've gone to a friends and family and or an alpha and then out to you know a, a public beta the early you can get those kind of integrated and think about them in your development pipeline, the better position you're going to be in when it comes time to launch, right? Those games, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, I have a anecdote of a customer that I helped. They were early in the development process, right? They were pre-alpha um, and I actually got to join them uh, on a play test. And, and they were doing this great iterative game development where every day they make a new build, right? Um, put that build onto, onto AWS and then play and and it allowed for things like exactly what i'm describing and what you're describing chris which is you can bring in anyone um even if it's just your own development team play the game uh and then collect those metrics back uh one really cool thing that i've seen developers do is create actual heat maps of levels to find out like hot spots of oh this is an area where um maybe like a lot of points are scored, right? Uh, the game I was playing was kind of like a pseudo soccer style game. Um, and you can find, you know, areas on the map where, oh man, like this is a really like brutal spot to, <laughs> to be uh, like scored on um, because of the way that the, the level is designed or it creates this like repetitive play pattern. Um, some pretty, you know, advanced insights just off of basic metrics, which I think is is something that developers really um, need to keep in mind is that even with like rudimentary data, right, like really basic data points, you can actually get some pretty advanced results back. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I, I say this because I don't want developers to be discouraged and think that they need to have like a PhD in, in data science to, <laughs> to be able to actually get benefit out of these pipelines, right? These analytics pipelines. Um, they can be really simple things like just, you know, is are, are players uh, dying like right in the specific spot? Or, um, you know, what's what are the scores? Are, are they relatively balanced, right? Um, right. These are the types of things that can really help you to understand uh, if players are enjoying your game, where they're engaging, um, and if they're not engaging as much as you want them to, why that might be. Yeah, no, I agreed. And I think where this is also gonna play, I think a really significant role is as game developers are taking their games across devices. So when we look at the way people play on console versus the way they play on PC versus the way they play on mobile may be very different. So they have the common game framework, common game loop, but they may discover that people playing on mobile are playing in a very different way than people that are playing on console, right? We saw that with games like Fortnite, for example, where people that are playing on mobile pretty much aren't building as much as people that played on console or PC, <laughs> right? And so that changes the way you think about what the mobile players of your games versus the desktop or, or the console players of your games are. This is what analytics can help dis help you discover, right? Is what works for those platforms, for those types of players, for those types of environments, for those types of mechanics that you have built into your game, right? So while analytics provides, you know, the data to help you make the, you know, a better game, right? It's not completely, you know, the silver bullet for everything. It just gives you more information to continue to refine the gameplay, reduce friction, get more people in, playing across more platforms, right? And that's why it's so valuable and important. Yeah, exactly. Um, I would be an outlier in that data set because I don't build even on PC. So I'm there you go. terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. Can't do it. Can't do it. And it drives my son crazy when he's just like, why are you either camping or sneaking? You're not engaging. I'm like, the goal of the game isn't to go ahead and rack up the most kills. It's to last the longest, buddy. You know, and that's what us gray hairs do, right? <laughs> so, all right. So... When we talk about building uh, the, these solutions and building the uh, or leveraging uh, AWS tools and services to create this analytics backend, and we talked about the importance of of um, protecting that player data and and sharing it, uh, you know, correctly and being able to track that, it really leans into security. It's one of the things that AWS, right? That is a priority for us. Is our shared security model, the fact that we always uh, err on the side of security versus everything else, right, including performance, because that is the most important thing to make sure that your data is secured. So, Karthik, let's talk a bit about that. How does security apply to the game's analytics pipeline? So the data that we get through the game servers, right, so we have gaming companies that have their game servers where the games are hosted, where players come together and they play on a hosted server, right? So the source uh, originating from the game servers is pretty well defined. It's it's structured, right? It's not random data. It's it's produced through the game SDKs, the clients themselves. It's a pretty well structured data. So once you have this data stream where it's collected, gathered, right? You need to it, it goes downstream to a downstream dependency. Let's say like folks, engineering teams who wanna run analytics on a game that has happened or is happening, right? That could be one use case. They want to run analytics on the game itself. Now, if you take two steps back, we have had some situations where customers, when there's a live match going on, uh, they used that stream of data to drop swag or like, you know, some ammo or skin to the players while the game was happening. So that is when you have access to the source itself, like from the game server, to the source, to the stream, and then to any downstream dependency. So data is well-defined and structured. So as you gather this data, store the data for, let's say for game development itself, right? You need to understand who the data owners are, right? The governance of data should be established. Sure, we would do encryption and transit, encry encryption, at tra encryption at transit or encryption at rest. Yes, that's the bare minimum. But what about data owners, data governance, right? So right. data owners, data stewards, data custodians, these are all the responsibilities that people who touch the data or interact with the data need to take as part of the responsibilities 
to make sure data is handled in a correct way as per local laws. So now another layer on top of this, I know we're going through a multi-layered cake. Another layer on top of this is actually um, let me let me let me let me stop you right there. You hit on something that we should dive into a little bit, right? When you talked about understanding where data is going and complying with local laws, right? This has really become a kind of a, you know, a hot point in the games industry, especially around things like GDPR and these sorts of protective um, pieces of legislation and requirements that have come in. So you want to know the age of, of the player, whether or not they have access to this stuff, the region in which it's going to, into, is it permissible with local laws? You know, for some things like loot boxes may not be um, allowed in certain countries or, or within certain, you know, um, player age ranges. So understanding that and being able to filter for that is critically important, deploying online games to a global audience, correct? Absolutely right. And the laws, so if, for example, within California, we have the CCPA, the California Data Protection Act, right? So now in GDPR, we have that in EU. Uh, India is coming up with its own version of uh, uh, data privacy laws. And there's so many uh, other countries who are coming up with standards that are local for their, uh, you know, for, their, uh, for their region. So what's happening is customers, uh, gaming, uh, gaming companies, they are following procedures per local compliance and they need to adhere to the data protection laws for that particular region and make sure player identity and player data is protected per local compliance laws. So it's, it's, a, it's a very dynamic organism on how data privacy and protection works in those regions. And as AWS is understanding these government's requirements, we are offering the solutions back for the customer. So to make sure that your data is available in the region, available in that region, so data never leaves from that particular AWS region. Right. So yeah. things like that, we are making sure that we are giving customers the option to adhere to local governance laws. OK, so to ensure that those systems are working uh, as needed. Right. What about the audibility of the data? Right. How do we audit that data in the analytics pipeline? That is such a cool topic. We can go for hours on that. So on auditability, uh, we have, so you're, as you're gathering the data, so S3 is our data store, right? You know, our primary data store. So we have tools like Amazon Macy that allows you to conduct scans or even like an automated data discovery that allows you to make sure that you have data that is required by local laws that govern that particular region or any other local, local laws that you have um, for data stored in that region. So we have Amazon Macy for that. Um, and then we, we also have customers, what, what they're doing is they're, they are using our cost and usage reports dashboards. It's what we call it as a cur. Uh, so they've built cost and usage reports dashboard on QuickSight, Amazon QuickSight. And what's happening is they're trying to analyze every VPC flow log that goes through their set of accounts that they own where the infrastructure is hosted. So to quote, follow the money, they're following the money where all the VPC flow logs, where all the data is, to understand how infrastructure is actually managed in a region or in a set of regions. So what's happening is they, they have this like high level 10,000 feet view of where the infrastructure is spun up. And if there's any data that's moving back and forth, uh, that's moving back and forth between those regions. So that's how they're using cost and usage reports dashboards. Okay. So when we talk about the data, you know, and, and I mentioned that we at AWS, we have a shared security model. So maybe we can talk about that briefly here. So who's responsible for security of all this data? So the data, so customer is responsible for security of their data. We can definitely help them. Um, like going back to the Macy example, the customer did come to us and they were like, hey, we have this massive data. How do we protect it? How do we audit it? Uh, how do we make sure that leadership is aware of where our data is stored? How, what kind of actions we are taking? How are we processing right to delete asks from customers? All those things, customers come to us and we provide them custom solutions based on their requirements. So uh, the responsibility is on the customer for the data, but for the infrastructure, that's definitely us on the AWS side, uh, but for the data itself, it's the customers. Excellent, excellent. All right, look, so we talked about, you know, why analytics matters in games. Um, we talked about the sharing of data with publishers and developers and how to do that on a granular level to achieve right, the needs that a developer has or a game has and all of the different services that may have to tie into that offering to provide, you know, the experience that a developer wants. Um, we talked about 
the, at which stage game developers should think about uh, implementing the, those analytics and how security applies to those game analytics pipeline and the importance of that security, right? So um, when we think about, you know, how to go ahead and do this, you know, you know I'm a, a developer that has never built these things before. Tim, where can we go to find out how to bring all those four pieces together and start playing around with our game analytics pipeline? Yeah, so there's two things that we would recommend customers to do. One is um, search for the AWS Game Analytics Pipeline. Uh, we do have the solution online, as Gabe mentioned earlier, uh, where developers can download it, install it into their own account, and start working with it. Um, also, reach out to your account team. If you don't know who your account team is, go to the AWS website and hit Contact Us. Uh, that will send an email to a bunch of people who will eventually get it, uh, your account team, and be able to work with you about how to implement for your needs. All right, so that was a quick dive into the importance of analytics and how you can go and stand up your analytics pipeline on AWS. Before we get out of here, let's see if there's anything that we missed. You know, what's one point you really want to go ahead and reinforce or, again, something we may have missed in this discussion here. We're going to go around our table of panelists here to find out what those are. So, Tim, what is one takeaway you would like our audience to know? Um, actually, one additional note is that the Game Analytics Pipeline is a recommended solution for games that are appearing on... So, if you're looking at a game for the... Uh, strongly consider reaching out to your account team quickly. Yeah, very cool. Very good to know, especially, yeah, as you point out, if you are making your game for you know, the audience, absolutely important. So great call out, great call out. How about you, Dominic? What do you got? Yeah, I, I guess if I were to say one takeaway, it's that you don't need to be a giant development studio. You don't need to be a AAA developer to implement analytics in your games. You know, there's off the shelf solutions like the game analytics pipeline that you can take advantage of um, to really gain insight out of your game without the amount of overhead that it would take to build one of these services yourself. So, you know, don't be, don't be scared. Analytics is not that far out of reach. Awesome. Awesome. Gabriel, one point that you want, one takeaway that you'd like our audience to, to know. I would say that analytics is a fantastic place for you to implement serverless applications or serverless services uh, to help keep those costs down and to help take off some of the overhead that you might have uh, with running a workload like this. Very cool. And Karthik. Yeah, uh, we touched on data governance and just to touch, just an expansion on that, invest in defining data governance standards irrespective of the size of your studio. They are super important. The organization needs to have a high level overview or top level overview on who has access to what and why. So invest, 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 invest in data governance standards. It is very hard if you do, if you go down the path of not investing in it and then doing it later, it's very hard. So it's a culture, it's a mindset that we need to invest in along with the standards and frameworks on data governance. So. Yeah, so good habits to start getting into now yeah. because it will just serve you going forward, you know? And the, there's so much content available, so many games to play, keeping your player base engaged, constantly creating better experiences, lowering friction, offering new opportunities for better gameplay and engagement is what analytics can help you achieve. And with that, I want to thank our panel of experts here that walked us through the importance of game analytics. And we'll see you next time on Boss Level.